Hello everyone, welcome back. Dr. Naveed Shah here, board certified pulmonologist uh, with the Home Rehab Network. Uh, welcome back after uh, all the uh, holidays, uh, coming back uh, answering your questions. Uh, so go ahead, far away. Um, just preceding me was uh, Alex, uh, uh, given uh, some of his takes on, on some of these questions. Uh, I see Lorna here has been drinking uh, Mulian uh, tea at night. Uh, that's a great, uh, you could actually even drink it during the day. Um, it's good to help get some of that uh, uh, mucus uh, loose and, and, uh, and out. Um, also, somebody asked about uh, bronchiectasis um, earlier. Uh, and I want to just address that real quick. Um, the issue with bronchiectasis um, is really ectasis is an irregularity in the, in the tubing uh, of the lung, and, and typically, uh, usually the smaller tubings. Uh, and, and so either they produce more mucus, produce more cough, uh, or that mucus gets stuck. And that's, that's kind of um, in a very general term what, what bronchiectasis uh, is. Uh, and, and so people have more mucus. It's harder to, to cough it out because the, the tubing's irregular. Um, and also, they get infections a lot uh, because the tubings are irregular and because they produce more mucus and because it gets uh, stuck more. So uh, most of these patients, uh, some don't have uh, a very big cough, but a lot of a lot of them have chronic cough and chronic congestion. Uh, so uh, a lot of these patients may be on a vibrating vest. They may be on a um, nebulized saline of different percentages. Uh, they may be on uh, some mucomus. They may be on uh, um, cough, uh, you know, something like uh, mucolytics. Uh, so th those are the ways really to get, get that mucus out. The other thing for bronchiectasis you really want to watch out for is reflux. Um, heartburn, reflux, uh, very common in these patients and can lead to infections, including uh, the dreaded MAC or Mycobacterium avium complex, uh, which is a fancy term for the cousin of tuberculosis, although you cannot really give it to someone. You kind of get it through the soil, the reflux, um, and uh, it's a very long treatment. So, uh, so I just wanted to go over that, that question came up earlier. Um, again, um, here at Home Rehab Network, uh, please um, check us out on uh, Facebook, check us out on um, uh, YouTube, um, Instagram, uh, Twitter, um, and uh, please uh, subscribe to our, uh, uh, our channel. Uh, and also, uh, we have the uh, uh, COPD group uh, as well. Um, I want to also go over Home Rehab as far as, um, you know, here at Home Rehab Network, um, there's no driving. You, you, you do it at, at the comfort of your home uh, or anywhere. You can use a smart device, uh, laptop, computer, uh, phone, um, iPad. Uh, any of those devices work. Uh, we've had people in their tugboats. We've had people in their um, trailers. Um, you know, going from uh, snowbirds going from the north all the way to the south. They've been doing it uh, as they're traveling. Uh, so, I mean, th there's really uh, no place that you, you couldn't do it. Um, and if you don't have internet access, uh, we can also help you with uh, non-internet access um, uh, through the, uh, the phone link. So um, there's really no excuse. Now, again, no travel uh, as far as getting to a place three times a week. Uh, I know some of the patients I see, uh, they tell me, well, I, I found you guys on, our, uh, on my own, um, but my physician had recommended pulmonary rehab, and it, it was just too far away, 40 miles away, 60 miles away. Um, so let your physician know that, that we are here, we're here to help their patients. Um, and again, no travel, uh, no wear and tear on your car, no gas. Uh, for your car as the prices uh, keep fluctuating. Um, and also, you don't have to bother anyone for a ride, uh, and some people have a hard time, you know, getting around. Um, then the other thing is, 
and what I didn't even realize, even as a doctor, um, that once you get to the hospital or the facility to do the pulmonary rehab, then you have to walk from the parking lot to uh, the actual uh, pulmonary rehab uh, place. That could be hundreds of feet, hundreds of uh, yards away, and that in itself is a tax. So you, there's none of that um, uh, coming, uh, do, doing uh, rehab at Home Rehab Network. Um, here's a question, does honeycombing mean the lung disease is more advanced? Um, so honeycombing is kind of specific to a few different types of pulmonary fibrosis or pulmonary fibrotic type of uh, diseases. Uh, honeycombing means that the, the lungs in that area, especially typically in the lower lungs, uh, have been really scarred over. And uh, those uh, areas are typically not really participating in gas exchange anymore. And that's what honeycombing means. It looks like a, um, if you've seen a honeycomb um, with all the little um, uh, kind of lines within it, uh, that, that's what it looks like. And it's, it's not seen in every type of uh, uh, fibrotic lung disease. There's a few different ones that you can see it in. Um, and, and it also gives you a clue to, the, to that diagnosis. Um, so one, it tells us that that area is not being, is not going to be well oxygenated. Uh, two, it tells us that there are specific diseases that cause that. So. That, that's how that, uh, that kind of uh, works out. So typically, again, it's found in the uh, lower lung zones, uh, the lower lobes, um, although you can have it in, in the upper lungs as well, but the, the, it's very rare. Um, typically from uh, mid to lower lung zones is where you would see that. Um, what does the koala measure and who sees the results? So the, the koala is uh, measuring um, well, there's three things that the koala can measure. Typically, it's measuring a uh, two-lead EKG, uh, and uh, the koala people, meaning this is a third party, um, and so we use it um, uh, to monitor patients, but uh, the, 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 they have their own people who are actually monitoring it, uh, and then they will send us alerts uh, if there's any issues, uh, and I've gotten many of those alerts. Uh, the other two things that the qual can do is uh, it can actually listen to heart sounds or lung sounds, um, and uh, that's also transmitted onto the uh, to the website. So uh, those are the three main uh, components for the koala, um, and um, the uh, they have their own people that are actually monitoring it. Uh, we actually look at it uh, if there's any alerts as far as the EKG uh, alerts are concerned. Um, if there's, if you have a follow-up with me, if you'd like to go over koala um, as far as um, sounds, uh, we can do that uh, anytime when uh, when you see me. So um, we can go over any kind of abnormal sounds that you're hearing, um, and and so that that's what the uh, koala would be for. Um, so again, the other uh, the other issue that that I see a lot of is that. Um, um, and I hope that that answers your question. Um, the, 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 going back to kind of the, the, the rehab, um, uh, again, no travel, and then getting to the, 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 the hospital, and then you have to this long walk, getting there, and it's like, well, I'm kind of pooped out now. I, uh, I couldn't even make it. I had to stop three, four times. Again, none of that with the uh, Home Rehab Network. Uh, and, and let your physician know, um, you know, those are really great benefits uh, of this, um, you know, of this program. Obviously, uh, there's a lot of other benefits as well. Uh, I got pneumonia a couple of years ago, and I've had uh, worsened breathing and a rattling cough off and off ever since. PFT doesn't show any significant damage. Echo is normal. Uh, is there anything I can do <clears throat> to get rid of this cough? Uh, keep me, keep my airways clear and improve my breathing. So. Um, a lot of times, depending on uh, the pneumonia, uh, you're saying a couple years. Um, typically, though, you'll see that for a few weeks, sometimes a few months. In the COVID uh, sense, you can see that for over a year. Uh, now, in your case, you may have developed uh, almost a reactive airway, um, in a sense. So uh, you're producing extra mucus. Now, um, 
the treatment for that, and I don't know if, if you've um, tried any inhalers, um, a combination um, uh, inhaler such as uh, Advir, uh, Simbacort, uh, th that kind of an inhaler may be a benefit to you. Um, if you're having recurrent episodes of bronchitis, uh, then what you want to do is make sure that somebody has sampled uh, your, uh, your mucus, uh, uh, meaning they've cultured it, uh, to make sure that you're not recurrently getting um, infected with the same thing. So uh, th those are the two things that I would, uh, I would try at first. If uh, the mucus has no culture, meaning it's normal flora, uh, and the inhaler's not working, uh, then um, you could try cough suppressants, uh, you could try uh, mucolytics. Uh, so those, that would be the, the next step. Um, again, um, whatever I say, please go through with your regular doctor. These are just advices um, th that I'm giving. Uh, pr please make sure that you discuss everything with your, uh, with your pulmonologist or your regular doctor. Uh, what does this actually mean? Spirometry shows severe obstruction with borderline bronchodilatory response, uh, significant air trapping, um, and decrease in diffusion capacity. So <clears throat> when you go through the, the, the PFTs, or the, uh, the uh, pulmonary function testing, um, severe obstruction is the, the, the first part of it is the spirometry, and that, that's where you, use, you would uh, look for obstruction, whether it's none, mild, moderate, or severe, uh, or very severe. Uh, and that, that's what that first section is going to tell you. Um, then, um, as far as bronchodilatory response, they'll take the spirometry, uh, and then they'll give you a NEB treatment, and then they'll redo the spirometry. Typically, um, and the guidelines are actually just changing now, um, as of like a couple days ago, uh, but typically we take 200 cc's change after a bronchodilator, uh, to um, which is about 12 percent uh, to show that there was an improvement in your lung function uh, and that's what it means uh, as far as a response uh, borderline typically would be 20 uh, the 12 percent would be the the cutoff so um, typically that would mean borderline bronchodilatory response um, s sometimes if if you see an eight percent or nine percent or ten percent you may uh, consider that as a borderline as well, but typically 12%. Uh, and the air trapping is now the second part, uh, and they would either put you in a box or give you some nitrogen. Uh, so uh, let's say you're in a, what's called a body box. Uh, that's where they measure the volumes, uh, and uh, what they measure is um, residual volume, um, and that will tell them uh, or tell you uh, that uh, there is air trapping. The third part of that, so spirometry, volumes, and then the third part of that report, and you'll get this report, um, th the first part has the loops on it, uh, the second part usually has some graphs, and the third part has a little bit of a, a graph as well, and that's the diffusion. The diffusion is basically um, how gas is getting from uh, your lungs into your blood. Uh, and the marker there is carbon monoxide. So um, uh, the CO is uh, three time, uh, 300 times more likely to diffuse over, and, and that's kind of what they use as a marker. So the, the, the point is, uh, or the, the, the concept here is, as far as diffusion capacity, is the oxygen or the air you're breathing, is it getting from your mouth to your lungs into the blood because if it's not then then there's a problem so either the problem is in the lungs or the problem is in the uh, blood vessels uh, either one is thick or the other sticker uh, and and it's just not diffusing in um, so that that's what the diffusion capacity kind of tells you now I will tell you if you do have a lot of air trapping uh, from the description that you gave me uh, you may want to look into the uh, lung valves um, because that, that's, uh, you know, uh, rehab, uh, pulmonary rehab obviously would definitely help you. Uh, but are you a candidate for lung valves? That may be a possibility as well. So you, you definitely should uh, look into getting uh, evaluated for lung valves. Um, what does it mean when you are in end phase of ILD and honeycomb effect? So 
Um, obviously, end phase means uh, the, the last phases, I, I would imagine. Um, so interstitial lung disease with honeycombing, typically you'll see that again in IPF, idiopathic, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Um, that is one of the main um, diseases or disease processes that causes honeycombing. Uh, again, you'll see it in the lower lung zones, um, and um, typically you'll see scarring, um, what they call subpleural, meaning just outside the, um, just at the borders of the lungs uh, coming down, and then uh, at the bottoms, um, you'll see this, um, you'll see this honeycombing. Um, I can draw a quick picture. Uh, let me go to the board here, if you want to follow me. Uh, so typically for uh, IPF, uh, you'll start seeing um, some scarring. This is the scarring that, that you'll see. It'll be right on the borders. But in this part of the lungs, um, you'll, you'll see the honeycombing. This is where you're going to see honeycombing. Um, and unfortunately, um, at that point, um, that part is really not really um, contributing to uh, to the gas exchange uh, and, and that part is is not going to change um, meaning that there's not much you can do uh, for this um, this part um, so uh, ho hopefully that answers your question now um, I saw a patient um, yesterday she was diagnosed with uh, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, um, and you can get scarring in, in, in the lungs there as well. But you see a lot of ground glass. So I want to just explain um, scarring versus ground glass. Ground glass is kind of a generic term, and it's kind of uh, on a CAT scan looks like a haziness. You can see that with a lot of different things. COVID is very common. You'll see ground glass with COVID. Um, with Interstitial lung disease is very common to see uh, ground glass. Atypical pneumonia is very common to see ground glass. Um, ground glass is inflammation, uh, and fibrosis is scarring. Um, fibrosis is not reversible. Ground glass is. In some conditions, ground glass, if it's not taken care of, will lead to fibrosis. Uh, so when you see ground glass, the glass is still half full, meaning you 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 can try to um, uh, you know get steroids or antibiotics or or some type of treatment to try to alleviate or mitigate the ground glass. Once it's scarred, um, you you cannot reverse um, you cannot reverse that process. So um, you know as long as there's ground glass, um, you know that can be taken care of. Now, the other thing I want to sh uh, let you know is that, let's say you see ground glass, uh, your physician's giving you steroids or they're giving you antibiotics or, or both, uh, make sure there's a follow-up um, in eight weeks or so to, to make sure that, that that's gone. Uh, if it's not gone, you know, then we have to look at what, 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 what's, what's missing, what, what are we missing here? So uh, make sure that that's uh, being followed up. Um, if they say your lungs are worse in, in bottom, then top, does that mean anything different than top to bottom? Um, so if, if you're, so usually your lungs are worse from bottom, uh, start at the bottom, uh, and not typically at the top. Um, certain, uh, so tuberculosis is one of them that'll be more top, um, top down. Uh, rather than most of the other ones would be from the bottom up. So it, it really doesn't matter. Just know that mostly it's going to be bottom up most, for the most part. Uh, doctor said, PFT shows my friend with asthma is having trouble expelling all of the air, but no issues with intake. Can a lung exercise be helpful? Uh, absolutely. So um, asthma, again, there's periods where you have lung um, air trapping uh, or uh, increase um, uh, volumes. 
You'll see that even on an x-ray for COPD, sometimes uh, even with asthma or chronic asthma, the lung volumes on an x-ray, you'll be like, wow, um, this person's only this tall, but the look at those lungs, they're really big. Uh, and that, that's the air trapping. So um, exercise is definitely, uh, especially for an asthmatic uh, or someone with COPD, uh, something that will help alleviate uh, getting some of that um, um, uh, air trapping out. Um, however, it's good to know how to breathe uh, when you're doing that exercise because if you're panting, uh, sometimes you're actually going to increase the amount of uh, air and uh, you're going to actually increase the amount of uh, um, air trapping rather than uh, if you know how to breathe uh, while you're exercising, uh, then, then um, you'll be helpful to expel more air than actually intake it. So, um, Yes, exercise will help, but knowing how to breathe when you're exercising uh, will definitely help as well. Uh, so that's something that, um, uh, unfortunately, pulmonary rehab by itself is not covered um, for asthmatics. I'm not sure why that is. Uh, I didn't make those rules. Uh, but uh, you can go to mynewlungs.com. Um, and uh, get a lot of our techniques um, through watching those videos as well. So that would be a resource for your friend um, to know how to breathe, especially when they're doing exercises. Um, if it's not coordinated, it's not, it's uncoordinated, um, you can get into more trouble that way. So, uh, so just, just be, uh, be careful there. Uh, what is the life expectancy in IPF? Uh, so, um, the answer is it's not good. Um, you know, they say two to five years. However, um, with the current medications, uh, it can definitely be longer. Um, the best thing to do, you know, there are IPF centers. Um, you know, especially if you're on our side, uh, meeting on the East Coast, so there's, uh, you know, I can tell you a few different ones, but um, they basically will see only uh, patients with pulmonary fibrosis, meaning that, that specific center or clinic uh, will only see patients with pulmonary fibrosis um, or ILDs. It's good to kind of maybe have a consultation there every um, once a year or something like that, um, or at least once, um, because they may be knowing or doing things that are, that are a little bit more advanced than other places. Uh, but um, unfortunately, IPF does not carry a very good prognosis uh, if it is, in, in fact, IPF. However, there are many exceptions. And I'll give you an example. I had a patient who was diagnosed with IPF, um, and I told him this is the, um, the expectancy, the life expectancy. So he quit his job. Uh, he said, uh, you know, I have a bucket list. I want to travel uh, through Europe. And, and, and he did that. Uh, I think seven years later, he's still at the same uh, level. It had not progressed. Uh, so. I, you know, I hate to throw out numbers and, and make people feel like, well, this, this is it, you know, you know, we should throw in the towel. I'm not one of those kind of people. Um, I'm one of those that try to fight till the end. And, you know, so uh, I, I think if we get bogged down with, with you know, certain numbers, I, I don't think that that's really helpful. You know, what can we do? I think that that's a more um, appropriate approach uh, in this sense. So. Um, I'm more of a um, JFK kind of guy where, you know, what, what can we do for our country rather than our country can do for, you, for us, that kind of thing. So uh, I, I think I if you are diagnosed with IPF, um, knowing, you know, uh, rehab is definitely helpful. Uh, you know, a couple of these medications, OFAB, Esprit, uh definitely are helpful, um, you know, prevention of uh, uh, exacerbations and infections is definitely helpful. Uh, so, you know, there are certain things that, that, that may be able to be done uh, to kind of prolong these things. People are now living a little bit longer. I think the initial, um, when we didn't really have anything before, um, 
you know, it was worse. Now it's it's getting better. So uh, definitely look into it as far as uh, have the glass half full. Uh, do vitamin supplements or diet help with IPF? Um, the quick answer is no. Um, however, um, the overall, you know, obviously p the, the, the main issue is that your uh, lungs are getting scarred over. We don't know what's actually causing that scarring um, to, the, to the point that there's nothing specific for that s scarring to, to, to halt, although the OFEB and, and Espriot or Profenadone uh, do kind of slow the process down. Um, it's not just a, a matter of the lungs then too. It also starts to work on muscles, on the rest of the body, on the heart. So I, I would say, uh, although the short answer is no, the longer answer is yes, in the, in the sense that, you know, you want to make sure that your muscle mass is not decreasing, that your weight, along with that muscle mass, is not decreasing. Um, so if it is, uh, definitely, you know, uh, we have a dietitian now, and, and she'll be doing some, some uh, um, uh, videos as well. Um, and, and I think that uh, we, we can have her as a consult, uh, if you wanted to consult with her, um, to talk about uh, certain supplements and certain things to, to help you with. Um, I think that that is a show on its own or a, a, a video series on its own. So um, the point I'm trying to make is that specifically for IPF, no, but the results of what IPF can do to the rest of the body, the answer is yes. Uh, and, and, and so the, the best way to do it is, is kind of have, you know, be followed with a dietitian um, someone that, that can help you kind of guide through. The main issue is really muscle mass. Uh, and, you, you, you know, it's not just with IPF. That's the same with COPD. Uh, loss of muscle mass is uh, con consistent or congruent with uh, worsening outcomes, more, um, you know, worsening um, infectious rates, worsening mortality. So uh, it's definitely a part and parcel of the whole thing, uh, although specifically there's nothing uh, that, that I know of uh, for IPF. Um, so uh, hopefully that answers your question. Again, uh, we do have a dietitian that, that you can consult with, um, and um, recently met someone uh, at a, a natural food store who also is a, is a nutritionist, um, and I'm trying to get her on the, on the show here as well. Um, and she can definitely give you um, many helpful tips uh, for the other issues. Uh, my husband developed uh, interstitial lung disease uh, from bleomycin toxicity during cancer treatment. Can his lungs heal? Are they permanently damaged? Are there any supplements uh, they can take to help? So again, bleomycin, uh, very common, unfortunately, to give the, uh, the, the uh, pulmonary fibrosis. Um, again, in the beginning, you will see some ground glass with bleomycin, and then you'll see the, the scarring. If it's already scarred, meaning there's already fibrosis at this point, there's not much that's permanently damaged. Um, if you're in that stage where you still see ground glass, yes, you can try, um, for the most part, steroids, uh, prednisone. Uh, but as far as supplements, Again, it's the same uh, answer that I would give for the, the previous question. Um, you know, there are nutritionists out there and there's dietitians out there. The issue is that we cannot do anything really for the scarring, uh, but typically bleomycin, uh, a little bit different than IPF in the sense that IPF is progressive, bleomycin is typically not progressive. Uh, it's whatever is scarred over at that point. Um, so that's kind of slight differences in, in trajectory and, and prognosis. Um, again, the issue is what are the other organ systems? How are they responding? Muscle mass, um, you know, heart, pulmonary hypertension, those kind of things. Can we prevent those? Uh, and I think that, that that's the other uh, part of this. So um, again, it's the same kind of answer for the IPF where 
nothing specific, but uh, look at other body uh, organ systems. So, um, how is hypersensitivity pneumonitis ruled out? Uh, good question. So, uh, one of the ways is, uh, you know, hypersensitivity pneumonitis is basically pneumonitis meaning inflammation, or that's the itis, pneumo being the lungs. Um, hypersensitive, again, it's an allergic type of reaction. Um, so I just saw someone um, uh, yesterday, uh, I, she was diagnosed with hypersensitive pneumonitis. One of the ways is there's a panel, there's actually two panels, probably a couple, um, maybe even more than that, uh, that have different uh, what we call antigens. Um, for example, um, Pigeon, very common uh, to cause uh, hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Uh, parrots, very common. Uh, but this uh, person uh, lives near a farm, so she doesn't have any pets. Uh, there's no bats in her attic. There's no like pigeons there. Um, what's happening is the uh, air through the wind is being coming into her house and affecting her and in, in causing her hypersensitive pneumonitis from the farm that's like down the road. Uh, and so that's kind of how she's getting it. Uh, you can do bronchoscopy. Uh, there are things called uh, granulomas, you can see. Um, and there are certain patterns for uh, hypersensitive pneumonitis as well. Um, it can scar over, again, so uh, be careful. Um, I actually asked her to move in with her daughter away from this farmhouse because it's a repeated thing and the more it's repeated uh, the more you're going to get um, um, you know the, the, the scarring may become more apparent uh, because the more you're exposed to it the more it's going to cause problems with your lungs and, and the worse it's going to be so um, Hopefully that answers your question. Uh, when taking an immunosuppressant cell sept, should try to avoid going to church, uh, stores, restaurants, etc. cetera. Um, so the short answer is um, probably. Uh, however, um, I'm also a person that would never want to sit in my house and do nothing. Uh, you definitely have to get out and about. Uh, so. You, know, you can wear a mask if you if you're able to tolerate it. Uh, sit at a distance uh, if you can, uh, but don't take yourself out of life. Right? I mean that that's not the point. So uh, you can modify or mitigate risks uh, by maybe being there in certain times where it's not as much of a a, a crowd. Um, you know, off hours or in the mornings. Um, you know, sit away from other people, uh, be away from others, or, or, or wear a mask. But uh, definitely don't um, uh, don't choose to sit sit in your house and, and, and you know not go out. Uh, not only there's there's a psychological benefit of of being out. You know, being um, especially on nice days, the sun itself actually has a very good psychological benefit. So, and obviously you're making vitamin D, and that in itself will give you, a, improve your, uh, your mood. Uh, so definitely don't lock yourself in. Uh, get out and, and do stuff. Uh, please speak to nodules that grow and shrink. Thank you. Uh, so when you see a lung nodule, when I see a lung nodule, or somebody is referring a patient to me, um, and I see a lung nodule, um, many times I can say this is nothing. Many times I can say I don't know. Uh, most of the times I'll say we'll have to follow it. Uh, so uh, typically if it's over 8 millimeters, you can get what's called a PET scan, P-E-T, PET scan. Uh, if it's below 8 millimeters, you can't get a PET scan. And typically below 8 millimeters, uh, you're just going to watch it. There are um, there are sometimes you'll see one nodule, sometimes you'll see a couple of nodules, and sometimes you see multiple nodules. 
if you see multiple nodules, typically that means it's an inflammatory process or a metastatic process. So those are the two typical scenarios with multiple nodules. For the most part, it's inflammatory, and those will come and go. If you have a condition, let's say you have lupus or you have scleroderma, uh, Sjogren's, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, very common to have uh, lung nodules. Um, and those are and typically inflammatory, um, and, and they will come and go. Typically, it'll take six months to a year, maybe longer, for them to come and go. The other thing that happens over time, if it's a benign nodule, typically over time it'll start accumulating calcium, and it'll show up like a, um, almost the same um, brightness or whiteness on an X-ray or CAT scan as a bone. Uh, that means that's basically healed, um, and the body's taking care of it, and you don't really have to worry about that. Um, so, um, number one, lung nodule, let's say you have one, um, it's less than eight millimeters, we'll watch it, more than eight millimeters, PET scan, even if it's uh, greater than eight millimeters, uh, then, then PET scan plus or minus biopsy, um, and if PET scan is positive and there's reason for concern, especially if it's growing or changing sizes, or it's irregular, then they may opt to do surgery uh, and take it out. Again, surgery for stage one uh, lung cancer um, is typically the way to go. Um, and it has the best cure rates, meaning typically it's around 65% uh, cure rate uh, for stage one A uh, lung cancer. So uh, hopefully that answers your questions. Uh, what are the risks for having a HRCT? Uh, HRCT is high resolution CAT scan, uh, and so uh, when they when they do it, uh, they do it in a way that the uh, the cuts through the the chest uh, are are very very small, um, and um, the risk is really you're getting a little bit more radiation. So there's regular CAT scans, there's low dose CAT scans, there's high resolution CAT scans, or the typical three CAT scans. That, that you may encounter. Low dose is typically for cancer surveillance. Uh, let's say you've smoked for a period of time uh, and uh, now we're, we're wanting to make sure that we don't miss any cancers. Uh, typically once a year you'll do a low dose CAT scan. Low dose meaning less radiation uh, than there's, there's the typical um, uh, CAT scans that we will do um, for lung nodules or, or a lot of other things. And then the high resolution um, more radiation, uh, so that's just really the risk. But in certain cases, for example, uh, interstitial lung disease, IPF, uh, high resolution CAT scans are really the way to go. Um, looking for blood clots is a type of high resolution CAT scan as well. Uh, but for the most part, most CAT scans or general CAT scans that you'll have in the hospital, let's say you're hospitalized, uh, typically those are not high resolution, those are um, regular resolution. Uh, CAT scans, um, unless it's for blood clots, then it is a higher resolution CAT scan. Uh, but beyond the radiation, um, I don't think there's any other risks. Now, if they're giving you dye, uh, especially if they're looking for blood clots, then there's a risk for the kidneys. Uh, and so typically they would want uh, your blood work for your kidney function before they do that dye test. If the kidney function is fine, um, then after you get the dye, drink some fluids, uh, get that dye out, uh, you should be fine. How can you use a pulse ox when you have cold, uh, bluish fingers for rain outs? Oh, that's a great question. You can't really use it at that point. Uh, you have to wait uh, either um, uh, before or after the rain outs episodes kind of uh, subsides. Uh, so. Um, so the answer is, yeah, you can't use it. Uh, you, you have to kind of wait. So uh, typically, rain ounce comes, as you know, um, if you're out in the cold. Uh, and even if it's a slight change in uh, temperature, some people get uh, rain ounce. You have to wait until it's, it's kind of over uh, before you, uh, you, you do it. Um, I heard red light therapy helps COPD. Have you heard of this? Um, so 
I haven't heard of that specific. Uh, I know there's light therapy that will help COVID, uh, but it's not red light, it's uh, regular light. So um, I cannot uh, really talk to you about red light therapy. Uh, unfortunately, I can't answer that question. Um, and I will say, if I can't answer the question, I'll say I can't answer the question. I'm not going to give you any kind of, um, you know, uh, something that I don't know. Um, very good questions, though. Thank you. Um, uh, any other questions, you know, put them in the comments. Again, Home Rehab Network. We do online pulmonary and cardiac rehab. Uh, we're on uh, Facebook. We're on uh, uh, YouTube. Uh, we're on Twitter. So check us out in these, uh, check us out definitely on YouTube and uh, subscribe to our channel. Um, we'd love to share more and more content and videos with you. I heard that a person can have asthma attack but still show normal blood levels on a pulse ox. Is that true? Absolutely, absolutely true. Um, so the uh, most people with asthma will have a normal pulse ox while they're having an exacerbation or an attack. It gets to a point where there's uh, changes in um, uh, cardiac output and uh, uh, bronchospasm and uh, mucus plugging uh, where you will start to see that decline and it happens very quickly. Different from someone with COPD, when they're getting an attack, it typically does lower their um, um, oxygen level rather quickly. Whereas an uh, asthmatic, because typically for an asthmatic, their lungs are actually normal. They just are hyperreactive. Uh, and there's also levels of attacks. There's milder attacks. There's more severe attacks. Uh, and then certain things that will set off those attacks as well. Um, but the main thing why that oxygen level is going down is because asthma is causing overproduction of mucus and it's causing bronchospasms. Uh, and so there's a hindrance of air getting to the alveoli. Um, and also there's dynamic changes as far as vascular changes, um, as far as cardiac output and stuff. So uh, those are the things that really uh, affect uh, the, um, uh, the oxygen levels. Uh, just having pneumonia when you're a child uh, help cause COPD? Uh, not COPD, but asthma, yes. That is definitely uh, in the, in the uh, uh, research and in the literature. Um, uh, peop uh, children that, that have uh, periods of uh, or recurrent episodes of pneumonia uh, are more susceptible to, to have uh, asthma for sure. Um, I'm uh, only short of breath occasionally, but very tired. Does this uh, still mean I have a problem with oxygen de depletion? Um, I'm not sure your lung issue. Uh, you could be short of breath for many things. Uh, being tired may be a result of whatever's causing your shortness of breath. Being tired may be that you're not sleeping well at night. Maybe you need a sleep study. Maybe your oxygen level at night is going down uh, and you're not aware of it, you can get uh, overnight pulse oximetry, you can do a home sleep study. Um, so you've presented two very big topics, shortness of breath and fatigue. Um, they can be kind of in a Venn diagram uh, connected to each other, but they can be totally separate issues as well. So, um, you know, simple things are, you know, Seeing your doctor, why you're short of breath, why are you fatigued, is it a neuromuscular issue, uh, meaning do you have MS or do you have myosinia gravis, um, is it um, you know, a lung issue, is it a, a chronic fatigue, something that uh, maybe uh, like a mono, um, you know, so there, there's many, many, uh, many things. So um, having a, seeing a doctor, making sure that uh, we're working out both things are, uh, is really what I would recommend. Uh, our neighbor directly across the street from us has hypersensitivity pneumonitis, and my husband was diagnosed with IPF. Should my husband have more tests? Um, so your neighbor was uh, diagnosed with, um, so I'm not sure how long you were in that house. I'm not sure um, the exact cause of your neighbor's hypersensitivity pneumonitis. 
Um, but if it's something you think that is in the air, again, IPF, there's two, two ways that we usually diagnose IPF. One is, what's the pattern on a CAT scan? Uh, and I kind of show you the pattern earlier. Uh, the other is biopsy. Um, for the most part, if you can see it on the CAT scan, you don't need a biopsy. If you're not sure, then you typically get a biopsy. Um, if your husband has had a biopsy, um, then, then that would, um, in my opinion, especially, so um, let me kind of backtrack. When you get a biopsy, um, typically the pathologist at that hospital is going to read that biopsy. However, you can have those slides sent to Mayo Clinic or Johns Hopkins or some other, um, you know, um, big place, uh, tertiary center, uh, to look at those slides and make sure that the initial diagnosis uh, was accurate. Sometimes the pathologists themselves at the local hospital will send them out to a, a bigger hospital to get them um, uh, looked at. So if, if that's already been done uh, and they've diagnosed you biopsy-wise with IPF, then it's typically IPF, and it's typically not hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Now, on a CAT scan, um, it may be different. So if they're saying that because the CAT scan looks like a pattern of IPF. Could it be hypersensitive pneumonitis or is it IPF? Again, I think you should dive a little bit deeper uh, to make sure one or the other. And you also can talk to your neighbor if he's willing to talk to you about what's causing his uh, HP and kind of if it's related to the air quality in that area, then your husband could have been affected by that as well. Um, again, um, history. Um, imaging, testing, uh, all of this uh, can differentiate HP from IPF. Um, so, and the trajectory is different, IPF prognosis versus HP prognosis. There's a fibrotic type of HP as well, so, um, you know, um, again, um, make sure that um, all the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted here. Uh, I think, um, you know, if, if you're not comfortable with that IPF diagnosis, if it's in a place where that's what they do, I think that th that's going to be the, the right diagnosis. But if you think that uh, there may be something more, uh, then, then I think I would, I would try to go a little further. Um, what kind of changes would be seen on a PFT or imaging if Sjogren's is starting to affect the lungs? Is there a m medication that can uh, help prevent lung damage from uh, Sjogren's? So, great question. Um, about 10% of patients uh, with Sjogren's uh, will develop um, pulmonary vascular issues, and a certain percentage will develop uh, pulmonary parenchymal issues. And then those that pr present with pulmonary parenchymal, meaning the, the meat of the lungs, can also go into the vascular issue. So let me explain. Um, Sjogren's is an inflammatory condition, uh, and uh, basically that inflammation can get into your lungs. Um, and initially, you may not uh, be able to see that on PFTs. But typically, if it does show up on PFTs or pulmonary function tests, it's going to be a restrictive airway disease. That's what they would say. Um, it's a very common restrictive airway disease. Um, and um, medications to prevent it, uh, again, Sjogren's can actually cause IPF. It's one of the uh, diseases that can actually cause an IPF type of uh, lung disease. Uh, so you would want to make sure uh, that, you know, are you on an effective dose of steroid? Are you on um, uh, medications uh, for uh, slowing down progression of pulmonary fibrosis, um, and um, are you also uh, accounting for reflux? Very common in patients with Sjogren's to have reflux. That reflux goes in uh, to your lungs, causes inflammation. That inflammation uh, can turn into fibrosis over time or infections. Uh, so uh, those are the things that I would suggest uh, as far as Sjogren's. 
uh, is IPF genetic. There is a genetic form of IPF, and typically those patients have a worse outcome, and typically those patients show the disease earlier uh, than the, the, the patients that don't have a genetic predisposition. So yes, there is an uh, IPF that's a, a, a genetic variant. Um, uh, unfortunately, you'll see that more in the 50s, uh, I mean age, in the, you know, as they're in the 50s, whereas uh, someone that's non-genetic, you'll see that more in the 70s. Um, and the progression is much faster for genetic versus the non-genetic form uh, of, uh, of IPF. Uh, hopefully that answers your question. Um, these are some very, very good questions. Hopefully I'm answering your questions uh, in, in a way that, that's good for you, that, that you can understand. Um, again, um, give us a call at uh, Home Rehab Network. We're here to help you. You can set up an appointment with me or, or one of our uh, uh, therapists here as well. Uh, and uh, you know, join us for the therapy. Um, we'd love to have you. My blood work shows Sjogren's and rheumatoid arthritis, but I have no symptoms. So that's very good. Uh, sometimes, um, and I've seen it many times, you'll have the blood work that's positive, you'll have no symptoms, um, then the blood work becomes negative, you still don't have any symptoms, uh, so that can happen. Uh, sometimes it's positive, um, it'll be years before you have any symptoms. That's another possibility. And sometimes you'll have symptoms and it's positive all at the same time. So there's nothing, uh, typically you'll have the disease and then we do the blood work to confirm it. That's usually how it is. You'll have symptoms of something and then we'll do this workup and that'll show it. Meaning it, it was really, I was having some arthritis or some joint pains and the doctor did this workup and then that's kind of what showed it. Um, but I don't have any breathing issues, so um, I don't have any other systemic problems, um, but they may be subtle issues, so typically rheumatoid arthritis, swelling or ache, achingness or, or pain in the joints, very common. Uh, Sjogren's, uh, typically you may have um, dry skin, uh, you may have some uh, uh, red, red spots uh, on your skin. Uh, you may have reflux, very common uh, with, uh, with Sjogren's uh, reflux. Um, you may have skinny long fingernails. Uh, you may have what's called clubbing uh, on your fingers. So th there's other things that, that may not be uh, uh, so apparent, uh, but may be more apparent to your, uh, um, to your doctor. Having said that, um, if you did test positive, um, you should probably see a rheumatologist uh, because um, you know they're the experts in, in uh, Sjogren's and rheumatoid arthritis. If this was done by your primary care doctor, uh, then I would uh, definitely go and see a rheumatologist um, to kind of confirm or to do further blood testing uh, to make sure that this is not a mixed connective tissue disorder or something else. Uh, that, that's what I would really recommend. Uh, if it was done through the, your rheumatologist, just follow their uh, uh, you know, instructions and guidance. Um, they're usually pretty smart uh, of the uh, physicians. They're, they're one of the smarter people. So um, those are the people that you really want to uh, follow. Um, great question, great question. Um, again, um, you know, give us a call. Phone number's right here on the board, 410-871-4601. Um, you know, tell your doctors about us. Tell your friends about us. Tell you, you know, anyone you know that may have some lung issues that could benefit from uh, rehab. Uh, please let them know. Uh, yes, uh, you said uh, that the Sjogrens could present as restrictive airway disease on PFT. Would that look l the same as a PFT uh, as asthma, or is there any way to differ? Yeah. So, um, so very good. Uh, let me. Um, so let me tell you that, that it would be different than asthma. Asthma is either what we call an obstructive disease or it's normal, meaning your PFTs typically with asthma are normal. Um, when you get to later stages of asthma um, or more severe asthma, you can see a, an obstructive pattern. Uh, but with Sjogren's, you would see a restrictive pattern if it's affecting your airways, if it's affecting your lungs. 
any time you have a fibrotic um, disease process, it's going to be restrictive. Um, with bronchiectasis or with COPD or with asthma, you're going to have an obstructive uh, type of uh, um, picture on the uh, PFTs. So that, that would be the, the, the difference. Uh, Sjogren's causes um, um, scarring in the lungs. That, that's really where, and that, that's what relates to the uh, restrictive airway disease. Uh, Sjogren also uh, causes pulmonary hypertension uh, or high blood pressure between the heart and lungs. So um, if you've been diagnosed with uh, Sjogren's and there's no scarring in your lungs, but you're short of breath, make sure you get an echocardiogram because uh, that's a preliminary test for um, pulmonary hypertension. Uh, and it is common or more common in children's uh, than in um, some of the other uh, um, connective tissue disease processes. Uh, less common, although possible in lupus as well, um, and less common, although possible in uh, rheumatoid arthritis. But Sjogren's, uh, about 10% of patients will uh, develop uh, pulmonary hypertension. And that is a consequence of either the Sjogren's vasculitis or pulmonary fibrosis leading to right heart strain causing uh, um, pulmonary hypertension, uh, which is, again, not actually a very good um, not actually a very good thing to have. So make sure that that's being looked at. Make sure you're getting um, annual or less than annual uh, um, uh, uh, echocardiograms to make sure that that's not happening. And if, if they do see uh, pulmonary hypertension on the echocardiogram, uh, there are um, specialists who deal with pulmonary hypertension. Um, and. The reason I stress a lot of specialists is because there are specific things that, that um, you know, you know, it's like a general contractor versus someone that just does windows, somebody just does this, you know, that's all they kind of do. Uh, they're more adept at that, that specific thing. So uh, I, I always tend to, if you have a special issue, you should go to a special person for that issue. Uh, what kind of changes to the lungs do you see from chronic radon exposure? Typically, for chronic radon exposure, you will actually not see any lung changes. Uh, radon typically, um, uh, at the doses that we normally see, does not really cause any lung issues. Uh, but it is one of the, uh, probably the second, I believe, uh, causes, uh, leading causes of lung cancer. Uh, so that, that's kind of what you might see, lung nodules or a lung mass, um, and you've never smoked before, uh, again, what I would highly suggest, and I would suggest this for everyone, uh, if you do have a basement, um, definitely get, uh, get it checked for radon. Uh, again, radon is very common um, for uh, lung cancer. Now, having said that, some people may have a long island in their uh, kitchen, or a lot of nice uh, granite countertops. Uh, they look nice, uh, but make sure uh, they're not uh, giving off a lot of radon because uh, they may be mined in an area where there's a lot of radon. Uh, they can also be causing some radon as well. So uh, make sure that the radon in your house is uh, being checked, especially if you have a basement. Um, and especially if you live in, in anywhere around Maryland, uh, there's a lot of radon in, uh, in Maryland. Uh, so make sure that's being checked. Uh, very good question, though. Um, again, um, if you've smoked and you have a lot of radon, uh, then um, the low-dose CAT scans uh, once a year uh, should be done. And uh, that you can do through your pulmonologist. Again, whatever I'm saying here, please confirm with your pulmonologist, your primary care physician, or any of the other physicians that you normally see. Um, because we're just giving advice here, um, and uh, um, you know we don't want to take this out of context. Um, and again, I want to make sure that um, uh, everyone, um, you know.
give us a call again. See us on uh, Facebook. See us on uh, YouTube. Uh, subscribe to our channel. Um, you know, we want to give you the best uh, uh, advice that, that, that we can. And we want to help you out with your uh, rehab needs as well. You know, tell a friend. Uh, tell your doctors. Uh, let people know we're here. We're here to help. Thank you very much. And I'll see you in a couple weeks. Thank you.